Our first speaker today is John Peterson. John is one of our originators in the Advanced Therapeutic Endoscopy Group. John was on faculty at the University of Florida, and prior to that uh, had a thriving practice down south in Florida. He's very well trained, um, having spent time at the Cleveland Clinic, and he's going to speak on a topic, gastroparesis, and some new innovations that are available to help a subset of patients, which have been very difficult in the past. Very good. Thank you, Kyle. How's that? Good? Thank you all for coming. Uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, talk about gastroparesis, which is something that we all see almost every day in our practices in some way, shape, or form, but many times we don't know exactly what to do with these people. In the hospital setting, they're in the emergency room almost every month, aren't they? Nausea, vomiting, pain, we think that they're drug-seeking, maybe they have disease, maybe they have something else, and we don't know really what to do with them, and they become a constant revolving door into the hospital system. In the clinic, we get frustrated because we try some of the medications that are prokinetics to try to make the stomach empty a little more efficiently, uh, but most of them don't work or have significant side effects. So along has come some new technology that has really been out there now for 14 years, but it's only been refined in the last few years that we can use it, and we're actively involved with putting in some of these, quote, pacemakers, or really neurostimulators that can enhance the way the stomach empties. Let's talk a little bit about gastric emptying as we all sit here and have scrambled eggs and French toast and bacon and all these good things. Be aware of the beauty of gastric motility. I think we all take it for granted. When we eat a meal, not a liquid part of the meal, but the solid component of the meal, it goes through a number of phases. The first is called accommodation, meaning that the proximal stomach becomes very receptive, somewhat dilated, somewhat atonic. It wants to receive the meal. The cardia, the fundus, and the upper body of the stomach want to do this. And it, it goes through a series of both neurogenic impulses to do that through the vagus and other nerves, as well as other hormones. There's a hormone that we're learning about in bariatrics called ghrelin. We, we're finding that ghrelin is a very powerful gastric stimulant of emptying. Nitrous oxide, uh, substance P, uh, peptide YY. These are all things that uh, involve the proximal stomach in creating a good accommodation state so that the meal can be received. Once it's received, now we go through about an hour, hour and a half of grinding. And, and the term is called trituration meaning that the meal is actually propulsed from the proximal stomach to the antrum to the prepyloric area. It abuts a closed pylorus. It throws it back. It throws it back, almost like a washing machine, back and forth. So this is some of the grinding and the, and the, the noise that you hear in your stomach on occasion for normal digestion. Some people have a little bit more vigorous digestion than others. But that's the grinding and trituration products. And it's really not until the size of the meal gets down to one or two millimeters that can actually leave the stomach, get into the pylorus, through the pylorus, into the small bowel, and go about its way. So it's really kind of a fascinating uh, process. Now we're going to talk about a pacemaker. There is a pacemaker in the stomach, and that pacemaker also generates impulses at, at three cycles a minute, one every 20 seconds, that drive the entire GI tract. And it's located, we believe, along the greater curvature of the stomach, about between the, the body and the antrum region. And it is fairly well defined. And we're going to see that there are some cells that are called the interstitial cells of Cajal, C-A-J-A-L that really are the ganglia, if you will, that interact with hormones and other nerve inputs that create these impulses that drive the emptying of the stomach. And typically after a, a solid meal, we do have a lag phase where a lot of this stuff is happening, and then a very rapid zero order kinetic kind of emptying phase where the solid meal is emptied, where it can then go into the small bowel and mix with bile and pancreatic juice and all the peptidases and all the things that are in the small bowel that allow us to break down the meal completely and be absorbed. So it's really quite a fascinating process. And I think, again, most of us take it for granted, uh, even in health uh, or disease, but it is very complex. I wonder if we could turn any of these lights off there. It's a little bright up front. Um, I don't know if you have that ability. What is gastroparesis? Well, gastroparesis is gastric, delayed gastric emptying 
in the absence of any type of mechanical obstruction. Now, it's most common in diabetics, but we're seeing more and more of what we call the idiopathic group. It probably make up a good 30 to 40 percent of gastroparetics are idiopathic. They're mostly post-viral infections with Epstein-Barr or CMV, and it creates a, a series of, of events that people get, off the, uh, get over the viral illness but are left with a motility disorder that is long-lasting. It, it's estimated that uh, anywhere from 5 to 10 percent of type 1s and a little smaller percentage of type 2s can develop gastroparesis. But the, the data is very clear that a, in a juvenile, after 10 years of having juvenile diabetes, there's probably a 50-50 percent chance that that patient is gastroparetic. It's a little bit less prominent in the adult onset type 2s. But again, you can tell by the number of people in the United States today that have these diseases, how many people that we're really seeing with these conditions. It's really quite amazing. Now, some confounding syndromes that I have a hard time uh, working with at times are these listed here. Rumination. Rumination is the process where a meal is chewed, swallowed down the esophagus, but then it's immediately regurgitated back into the mouth like a cow uh, chewing his cud, right? And that material is rechewed, re-swallowed, re-regurgitated, swallowed. It's an unusual disorder, but it's real. Uh, it does happen in the setting of psychiatric illness, but in some people, it's just a phenomenon. And it's very, very confusing because people say that they belch and regurgitate and want to vomit sometimes, but it really is not gastroparesis, it's rumination. The other is the cyclic vomiting syndrome that we see. Now, this is not just in uh, stressed out young people. It can be seen in young people, middle-aged, and even 70 and 80-year-olds. I've seen it. It's typically a syndrome that is not associated with true gastroparesis, but it is a process where people will vomit and retch and feel terrible for days at a time and then have fairly long intervals of weeks to months where they're doing just fine. And then the cycle repeats itself. So it, it clearly is not the day-in, day-out drudgery, that's nice, thank you, uh, of uh, gastroparesis, but it's real. And it's very hard in the hospital sometimes to sort these people out until you have a quality gastric emptying study. Cannabinoids, we all know what these things can do. And now with the recent vote in, in the states, uh, it's interesting to see how the public has uh, looked at these things. Cannabinoids in overuse definitely cause nausea and vomiting. And a lot of us do believe, and we've been able to prove, that's great, that it indeed causes gastric dysmotility, the cannabinoids. And of course, we all know what the anorexic and bulimics do. They inherently have problems, but a lot of, t a lot of people are now showing that anorexics have an inherent gastric emptying disorder. And some believe that that, that emptying is too brisk, and in some of them, it's too slow. And then the bulimics are kind of a, a mixed bag. So it, these are the syndromes that are kind of difficult, but, but should come out when you take a good history and physical when they come into your clinic or into the hospital setting. Now, what happens with gastroparesis pathophysiologically? Well, this clearly is an autonomic neuropathy. And you remember that we have an autonomic nervous system that is the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, and we also have an enteric ner nervous system that is closely aligned with the uh, autonomic system. They're all intertwined and we find clearly that there are abnormalities in these interstitial cells of Cajal, the ICC that I put here for you. And we, we know very clearly in the diabetic population is that when blood sugars raise above 200, gastric motility slows and changes. When it becomes 250 to 275, it becomes even more accentuated and beyond that, the stomach almost shuts down. And we've also seen that in the hyperinsulinemic type 2 diabetics, their motility is influenced by hyperinsulinemia to slow it down, to impede its normal uh, emptying. There's also a question, that are, are these people just psych psychiatrically imbalanced? Well, some of them become that way after a while. They become narcotically addicted. They become uh, hooked to Zofran and Phenergan and and a variety of anti nauseant products. They're on anxiolytics many times. They've been shuffled around many ERs and many hospitalizations. And it's very difficult to cut through them to see how can we help these people? If medical therapy is not helping, what's the next stage? And that's what we're going to talk about today. What is interesting is that in gastroparesis, if you look at the whole population, 82% of them are female. Don't know exactly why. 
Uh, maybe it's progesterone, maybe it is hormonal uh, in nature. The mean age of onset is around 34. So it's not a childhood disease as a rule, unless you're a, a, a type one diabetic. And it's typically not a disorder that comes on in the 60s and 70s. It, it's it's a, a strange disorder that again, we're still trying to learn more about. What happens in diabetics? This is a whole subset uh, of interesting changes. We, we find that the antrum becomes less propulsive. We find that there's incoordination between the antrum and the duodenum. That pyloric channel is the gatekeeper of the stomach. And if that gatekeeper is either too tight or too loose or too spastic and not in line with what those interstitial cells of Cajal are trying to drive, then we don't empty. We've also found that in diabetics that compliance of the proximal stomach is almost too much. The accommodation phase is way too much in a diabetic. So they can store food almost like a, a squirrel uh, you know, storing nuts in his mouth for a long period of time. The stomach can be incredibly compliant in diabetics. But the key, and this is where gastric stimulation and pacing is going to come, is the vagus nerve. And we believe that Entera, this product made by Medtronic that I'm going to show you, is a direct vagal stimulator to try to enhance motility through its interactions with the vagus nerves it's, itself. We've also found that nitric oxide, which is found throughout the GI tract, the way it is metabolized is very defective in people with gastroparesis from diabetes. What are these interstitial cells of Cajal I keep talking about? Well, they're important because they are the train. They drive this train. They're the locomotive. And if there is loss or dysfunction, what do we do? Well, there's abnormal visceral sensing. that The body cannot talk to itself as far as when one segment of the small bowel or colon or stomach is distended and another is collapsed, they're not talking. And this is where the interstitial cells uh, uh, help us. When we hear of gastric dysrhythmias, they're almost like cardiac dysrhythmias. We hear about atrial fibrillation. We work with that every day. Well, there are, uh, there are also tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias in the stomach. We call it bradygastria, tachygastria. And it's all thought to believe to be originating from these interstitial cells. These cells also, again, talk to the pylorus and, and, and uh, regulate its function. We, we've seen people with pseudo-obstruction where they have an obstructed-looking picture throughout their small bowel and colon. It's because of the interstitial cells being dysfunctional or being uh, not enough in, in quantity. And people that have colonic inertia and severe constipation, which we'll see with irritable bowel syndrome, it is believed that a lot of this may be generated way up in the stomach along that greater curvature. Now, what causes gastroparesis? We, we know the big players. That's diabetes. Uh, but the, the other group that I mentioned to you, the idiopathics, I think are fascinating. These are people that are healthy. They have an infection. We think it's probably Epstein-Barr. It might be CMV. It might be other enteric viruses. And those viruses get in our system. They do their thing. The patient may have a common cold, get over it. Then all of a sudden, two months later, they're left with, I'm nauseous. I can't eat. I'm, I'm dysfunctional. And we find that they're profoundly gastroparetic. So that's the idiopathic kind of post-viral uh, scenario. Now, we also have a variety of people that have autonomic uh, dysfunction. It, we've heard of Shy Drager. Remember Shy Drager? We see people with scleroderma. We, we also see people with amyloidosis. Infiltrative diseases have this problem. People that have pseudo-obstruction uh, from whatever cause. CNS diseases like Parkinsonism. Cyclic vomitors, again, we talked about the majority of them not really having true gastroparesis, but when you look at the cyclic vomitors, 20% of them are slow in their gastric motility. So they clearly have something going on. Here's again the rest of the shopping list, and this shopping list can go on for another 10 different disorders. The functional disorders, we, we think a lot of people with irritable bowel and, and quote, functional disease still have a gastroparetic component of their disease. All the people that had antrectomy and vagotomy, remember that back in the 70s and 80s when people had peptic ulcers that were not getting better with antacids? They would have half their stomach taken out and their vagus would be cut. Well, these are the people that we're seeing now later in life with significant post-vagotomy gastroparesis. We also see it uh, commonly in people that have had fundoplications, Nissen wraps for reflux, that that vagus is tugged on. Sometimes it's damaged significantly, and not only is their reflux maybe controlled, but their gastric emptying is markedly impaired. So we're seeing this quite often now. 
hypothyroidism, and stage renal disease. These people that are sick in the dialysis unit, it's not just because they're uremic, it's because many of them have gastroparesis. So look at your renal failure patients, and if there's any question, do a gastric emptying study on them. I'm going to show you a list of medications that can cause this problem. We know that the anorexics have emptying problems. Lupus, rheumatoid, polymyositis, pregnancy. These are all documented states that have significant gastroparesis as part of their, their uh, makeups. Here's some of the medication culprits. I mean, we work with these all the time, right? Any type of an anticholinergic is going to slow gastric emptying. The narcotics, these are endemic in, in America today, right? Any narcotic is going to slow motility. And when you go to do a gastric emptying study, make sure you try to get these patients off their narcotics for at least two or three days before you study them, because otherwise the study will be useless. So try your best to get them off. I know that's hard to do. Tricyclics, the use of TPN, we have to element our patients. Not only does it take their appetite away, it slows gastric emptying, TPN. Calcium channel blockers, the progesterone agents that are part of uh, hormone replacement, alcohol in general, nicotine, and you can throw the cannabinoids in here as well. All gastric uh, uh, dysfunctional agents. Now, what are the symptoms? We, we know that nausea and vomiting is the prototype and pain. And a lot of people don't believe that pain should be part of this disorder, but it really is. 60 to 70 percent of gastroparetics will tell you they have significant pain, whether it's from gastric distension or it's from ganglia being a little bit unhappy. Uh, don't know exactly where some of their visceral pain comes from, but it's real. Early satiety, their, their reflux becomes out of control. Maybe that's why you're seeing them in your office, that they have unrelenting regurgitation and reflux. Well, it's because the, emp the emptying below is dysfunctional. So their GERD can get out of control. Changes in blood sugar levels uh, happen. When these people are not eating, they're obviously hypoglycemic at times. Some of the diabetics, though, will come in. They're at 300. They may be at 80 the next day. They're all up and down uh, the map. And, and blood sugars are very difficult to control in these patients because you don't know if they're in a good phase or a bad phase in their digestion and emptying. They lose appetite, and sometimes they lose profound amounts of weight. But I can also tell you a little caveat that a lot of these gastroparetics are, are obese. It's because what they eat. They try to get by with milkshakes and chocolate and sweets and things that they can at least get in the stomach that are semi-liquid or mechanically soft, get by with them, and as a result, they can still gain weight despite being profoundly paretic. So don't throw the obese patient out of your, out of your practice because you just don't think that they have gastroparesis. They may indeed may have it. A little bit small on the slide, but I'll tell you uh, briefly, how, how do we make this diagnosis? Well, I think an upper endoscopy is important for the patient that has upper abdominal pain and nausea. You need to make sure they don't have something peptic or neoplastic in their esophagus, stomach, or duodenum. An upper GI uh, done in the past doesn't really give us a lot of information about uh, emptying. Ultrasounds used to be done to look at the size of the gastric cavity, but again, not real helpful. We then move on to where, where the bottom line is, is that the state of the art is with a four-hour radionuclide gastric emptying study. And to be honest with you, the way we do them at Baptist, they are upright. It's also important not to do the emptying study flat. It will give discrepant results. And make sure that your, your center where you're doing these, whether it be a, an ambulatory radiology center or your hospital setting, they're not doing a two-hour, they have to do a four-hour. It's, it's vital. The two-hour will miss a vast percentage of these patients with paresis. So I know it ties up their machines and they get a little bit upset that the techs have to sit there and work with these people for four hours, but it is vital that we do a four-hour emptying study. And the one that we do is a technetium sulfur uh, labeled meal. It's usually a small scrambled egg with a piece of bread, a little bit of jelly on that bread, a glass of water, that's it. They watch the meal over four hours in a quiet room and again semi-upright to upright and this is how gastric emptying is analyzed very technically. Now in Florida we did a lot of gastroduodenal manometry. We don't do that here in town. Uh, it, it was a, a tube that was placed into the 
uh, pyloric channel and out into the duodenum, and you could really assess these slow waves of contraction of the stomach and then how it changes in the duodenum. You know, it's, it's an interesting study at a tertiary center, but it doesn't really help us in, in the practicality of, of what we do here in town. Electrogastrography is a sensor that's put over the stomach and then gives the uh, examiner an idea of the frequency of these slow waves. Is the patient going at three cycles a minute? Are they at 10? Are they at one? You know, it's, it's a rough, non-invasive way of telling how emptying is working, but still doesn't match the radionuclide study in any way, shape, or form. Radio-opaque markers can be taken. It's a little capsule with 10 radio-opaque little discs. You swallow that. You take a, a picture in four hours, and if eight out of the 10 are still there, it's thought that this is abnormal gastric emptying. It's, again, it's a poor man's way of doing a radionuclide study. Not super accurate. Don't even use it here in my practice. And I think you, some of you may have heard about this smart pill. Uh, you've heard about pill cam that we do when we look at the small bowel and now a pill cam from the colon. Well, there's a smart pill that's out there. We don't use it in town here, to be honest with you. Expensive uh, piece of uh, uh, equipment. It measures pH. It measures gastric pressure and temperature within the stomach and gives it back to a little recording uh, device. So when the pH changes from 2 to 7, you know that that capsule is emptying, right? It's going from stomach to duodenum. But again, it, it's, it's a rough assessment of emptying. So all these things are interesting to know about, but the bottom line is four-hour gastric emptying by radionuclide study. Now, we have a gastroparetic patient. What do we do with them? Yes, sir. Well, it definitely make the stomach hypochlorhydric, so the smart pill wouldn't, wouldn't be very worthwhile, would it? But as far as we know, the PPIs don't change motility, which is helpful because everybody's on a PPI, right? We wouldn't know what to do with them. But yeah, a PPI will not interfere with that four-hour radionuclide study, so that's important. But that's a good point. So we have gastroparesis. Well, what do we do about it? Uh, do we scratch our heads and refer them, or do we try to work with this? Well, first we look at their hydration and their nutrition. We try to en en enhance that. We, we advise small, frequent meals. We advise low-fiber containing meals and low-fat. Fat itself is a gastroparetic agent. Ga fat in the meal slows gastric emptying. And same thing with fiber. So we want to have a low-fiber, low-fat containing reasonable diet spread over five or six meals a day rather than two or three big meals. We control their electrolytes. We control their sugars, right? We give them antiemetics. Phenergan, Zofran. I like a scopolamine patch. I don't know if you've tried that, but I like it very much for these gastroparetics. A nice a scopolamine patch is very helpful at smoothing them out rather than giving them something every four to six hours. Uh, we, we, we definitely have the psychiatrist involved if we think that's a component. And many of these people are depressed and despondent, and they're tired of being ill. So we have them involved. The prokinetics, I'm going to show you the prokinetics on the next slide, which we all try to use. Some of these people are so drastically ill, we have to give them enteral nutrition, either through a tube down into the duodenum, or we put a peg in them, or we put a pedge, a, a, a percutaneous jejunostomy in them, which we can do endoscopically. So those are all uh, ways of, of going about it. Let me mention the peg, though. When we put a peg in, it goes in right along the interstitial cells of Cajal, right along that greater curvature. That's where a peg goes in. That's why we don't like putting pegs in. We like putting pegs in if we have any, any choice. We don't want to disrupt that area that is the locomotive of motility. So we try to hold off on pegs. And Tara is what I'm going to talk to you today about from Medtronic, the gastric pacemaker, if you will, a neurostimulator that changes these people's lives. Now, surgery, what have we done? In, in past, we've done pyloroplasties. We've done gastric emptying studies as far as partial gastrectomies, total gastrectomies, gastrojejunostomies. Those are radical, rash maneuvers that are rarely done now if we can help it. But it has happened in years past. So surgery is hopefully going to be put to the side, and we're going to look at some of the, either the new prokinetic medications, or we're going to look at Enterra. Ty, did you have something? Yeah, John, I struggle with whether to use the antiemetics or not, because the patient, because the patient had a lot of nausea, but as you know, it's anticholinergic. It could make it worse. How do you decide whether to use them or not? 
It's true, and they become very addictive too, right? And Phenergan can make people high, uh, real high. So it has to be used very cautiously. That's why I like the patch. It doesn't seem to have as much anticholinergic activity, I'm finding. And Zofran, the, the Ondansetron-like drugs, don't seem to have quite as much anticholinergic-like properties. So if you had a favorite, probably Zofran over Phenergan, and maybe take a look at your scopolamine. That, that's what I would suggest. Here are the prokinetics that we have, right? And, and how many of them really work? These are frustrating. These are, are difficult to administer. They have side effects. They have black box warnings, right? You know that with Reglan. Reglan is a tremendous drug. It's been around for 30 years. It's a dopamine antagonist. It's a very powerful, good drug. I've had no problems with it, but there's been some disasters with this drug. Parkinsonian effects, tardive dyskinesia, uh, just very, very difficult to manage if you're not following the patient. And the people that have had troubles are the ones that have been put on Reglan and then not seen again for six months or a year. And all of a sudden, they're twitching, and their faces are grimacing, and they're tapping, and they're all over the place, right? And then the lawsuits start flying. So when we see people in our clinic and they take Reglan, we have them sign a waiver to show that we've talked about the drug. We're going to follow these people carefully, and it is a black box warning drug. So you have to be very careful with it, but still... Keep it in your armamentarium because I think it works for a small cohort of people. Erythromycin, yes, it's an antibiotic, but it's one of its more powerful purposes is the stimulation of motilin. Motilin is a hormone that enhances gastric emptying. Okay? So if you can give small doses of erythro, and in fact, erythro does not have to be given 250 QID to be a prokinetic. It can be given as small as 50 to 75 to, at the most I give, is 100 milligrams AC. That is a prokinetic effect of erythromycin. And it, again, it has tachyphylaxis, so you only give these drugs for three weeks of the month. Three weeks on, one week off with, with modalin drugs, the macrolides like erythromycin. But again, a very effective drug, but keep the dose down. Cisapride, you remember Cisapride? It was here, propulsive. It went off the market because of QT prolongation and some sudden deaths. Well, a lot of people are trying to get it back. Right now, it's not back, so we can't really do much with it. Probably the most exciting drug that I work with is called Domperidone. Now, it's not available in the States, but it's very easily obtained from Canada, and it's quite cheap, and it's very effective. The dose is 10 to 20 milligrams AC. There, there's a, and if you have any interest in using some Domperidone, let me know. I'll get you to the Canadian website. The patient literally orders it from the site. The site delivers it right to their home. For, uh, for a very nominal fees compared to American drugs. And I find the drug very helpful. So if I have to go to a prokinetic and I'm striking out with erythro or reglan, domperidone is definitely my first choice. Tegasarod, remember Zelnorm, it, it's gone now. Again, maybe it'll come back, but I'm not sure. Bethanicol, the muscarinic agonist, Again, it's available, a lot of side effects, a lot of cholinomimetic side effects, so we don't use a lot of it. Here's ghrelin. Remember we talked about ghrelin? Well, there's, a, there's in phase three studies now, there's a ghrelin agonist that is very exciting that's going to come to the market probably in the next two years. Ghrelin. It's a very powerful hormone that stimulates gastric emptying. And yes, Viagra. Viagra is there. You got the two, the two bathtubs, you got the people on the bathtubs holding hands, right? Yeah, you got some Viagra, you got gastric emptying. It, it's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, and through some very intricate measures, it does play somewhat of a role in enhancing gastric emptying. I don't know that it would be my first choice, right? Maybe some guys it might be. Anyway, let's talk about gastric electrical stimulation now. This is not pacing, this is neurostimulation, neuromodulation. What does it do? It improves that gastric accommodation we were talking about. It has direct enteric effects. It enhances the vagus. That's its number one claim to fame, and this is what increases gastric emptying. It also has been thought to activate some of the central neurons up in the tractus solitarius, the base of the fourth ventricle where the nausea centers are. It, it, it is thought to have some interaction with these central uh, locations that, that then dull the nausea and vomiting effect of gastroparesis. 
My, my mentor at Yale was Richard McCallum. He's written more about gastric pacing than anybody in the world. He's still a great friend, and he has shown us very, very clearly that there is a gut-brain access that we all have. It probably, our gut talks to our thalamus, our caudate, uh, our putamen. There are interactions going on between the stomach and the central nervous system like you can't imagine, and it's been shown in humans and other mammals that that does exist. So this is where the gastric stimulation may be acting as much centrally as it does right on gastric motility. Again, this is stimulation, not pacing. Pacing, like a cardiac pacemaker, is when a device activates contractions that are inherent to the, to the paced rhythm that it's working with. In the stomach, it's three cycles per minute. Well, if you were to pace a stomach, you would, you would activate it with low frequency, high energies, uh, contractions at three a minute and try to entrain or capture that inherent rhythm. Well, that hasn't shown to be very effective in humans. So gastric pacing per se is not there. But neurostimulation now is a different ball game. And this is Entera from Medtronic. This is what activates the nausea and vomiting control mechanism. And it uses high frequency, 14 contractions per minute, not three, 14 per minute with low energy, and we're going to show you the device here in one second. Here's a cartoon that shows the stomach. Here's where those interstitial cells of Cajal like to live, right? Right about in this area, wedged between Meisner's and Orbach's plexus in the smooth muscle of the stomach wall. This is the Antera pacemaker, and I'm going to pass this around so you can look at it and touch it and feel it and see what it's all about. And maybe just put those in the back of the room and I'll get them later. But it shows you how uh, thin and lightweight the device is. Basically, the generator here on the bottom that you're going to feel is here. It has two electrodes that are placed. These are all done laparoscopically. These are done at Baptist downtown here. Steve Hodgett is a very fine laparoscopic surgeon with North Florida Surgeons. He and I have partnered, and he is the only one putting them in here in town. And he does a wonderful job. And these things are placed in the seromuscular layer of the stomach wall. They're a centimeter apart. They have to be, be, be maintained in a parallel distribution. They go back to the generator. The generator is implanted in a subcutaneous pocket right here in the upper, upper abdomen, either left or right, in a little pocket that I can then transcutaneously, I can interrogate with a device to show how the pacer is working, how the modulator is working. The, the procedure takes about 45 minutes. It's done in the outpatient setting. It's in surgical day stay. These people are not even admitted to the hospital. And it's a beautiful technique. And thus far, I'm going to show you our data. We've done 10 in the last year, and, there, and for the most part, have all done beautifully. We've not had any complications or, or issues, knock on wood. Uh, this is, again, the Intera generator. It's gone through a couple of phases of, of modulation. And this is the new and, and most important. This is the computer box that I hold in the office when I go to interrogate the pacer, usually at the month, at the month visit, the second month, third month. I see them at monthly intervals for, for three months. And we can actually put the little uh, device on the back of the computer, lays right on, on the generator, and I can tell how the generator is performing. And I can also generate, see how its battery life is doing. The batteries last anywhere from eight to 10 years, so they only have to be changed periodically. So it's very exciting, exciting technology. What is Intera? Well, it's two short pulses at 14 uh, units per, per hour, per, excuse, per minute. 14 per minute. Instead of the three per minute slow waves that we have in our stomachs, this is at 14. And it clearly does improve their GI symptoms. It, it cuts in, excuse me, uh, to hospitalizations, their use of their prokinetics, the use of their narcotics, medical costs, it's been, been very, very well proven that in the long term of, of using this device, it cuts down on medical costs. The nausea and the vomiting are the most important symptoms that improve. Sometimes the pain does not go away completely, but that, that terrible feeling of living with nausea and vomiting goes away. Overall, the literature will show us that 60 to 75 percent of people that have had Intera implanted are, are symptomatically improved, which is impressive. This, again, device has been around since 2000, and it was given the FDA's humanitarian distinction, meaning that no more than 4,000 of them can be implanted in a year. 
4,000. So it's not like it's a, a deluge of activity around the world. But so they try to keep the, the implantations down to a controlled uh, uh, limit. Again, how does it help with anti-emetic effects? We think that it probably directly affects the enteric nervous system. It affects the vagus. And as I talked to you, it, it may have some central actions on the thalamus and the caudate. Now, the study that I was involved with, Mike Hawking at the University of Florida, when I got there in uh, 99, Mike was implanting. He's a surgeon at Florida. He was implanting the pacemaker. And I got there and got interested. And we contributed uh, five patients to this big international study, which was called WAVES. There were 33 patients, 17 diabetic, 16 were idiopathics. And this was a sham study where we were able to turn the generator on for a couple of months at a time and then turn it off for a period of time and then tell the, ask the patient, well, how, you, how were you doing during those different cycles? And then made a change where we would cross them over to the on uh, setting. At 12 months, what did we find? 70% of them had at least a 50% reduction in their vomiting rate. And the majority of them had marked improvements in their overall quality of weight. They gained weight. People that had G-tubes in had been reduced by 85%. The prokinetics were knocked down significantly. So this was the first to show uh, in 2003, kind of show the world that, hey, this thing had a role. Uh, it, it needs to be further investigated. And again, the FDA was uh, accepting of all that. <coughs> Excuse me. The National Antero study was done by Harvey Parkman at, at Philadelphia. He's also a fine motility expert. And uh, what, what this was a national study throughout, uh, it was about 16 different centers in the United States. Overall, this is what they saw. Symptom scores improved significantly, weight increased, J-tubes stopped almost all of them, hospital days were markedly reduced, prokinetic use dropped, efficacy, again, durability of this device was shown even at 10 years. So that was exciting data. Here's our experience at Baptist and Borland Groover Clinic. 10 cases that we've done in this last year. The age, the average age was 48. We had eight females and two males. Very typical of, remember we said that gastroparesis occurs in about 80% of females? And this is how it all shook out. Diabetics were six, we had idiopathic three, and then we had one post vagotomy one. The duration of their symptoms, you can see these people have been miserable for a mean of six years. Uh, a number of them were on narcotics. We saw that three of the 10 were on them before. None of them after the implantation right now are on narcotics, which is unbelievable. Their main symptoms, of course, nausea and vomiting. Their gastric emptying study, there's that four hour study. No, anything above 10% is abnormal. They were averaging about 35%. So what did we see? 80% of them have had, had improved GI symptoms. Their quality of life has improved by the SF36 score. 75% of them are off their prokinetics. And all of them at one year are off their narcotics, which is beautiful. So I, I think if you look at the Entera and you say, well, which people are going to do better and which were not, the diabetics clearly do better than the idiopathics. The people that have mostly nausea and vomiting more than pain, they are, the, they are the ones that are going to respond to this technology. And if they're independent from narcotics prior to being implanted, they're going to do a little bit better. And that, that makes sense. What are the adverse events? Well, these have all been reported, but, uh, but again, few and far between, I have to tell you. Infection, either in the pouch or on the wall, a pain, lead penetration. Occasionally, these leads will penetrate into the wall of the stomach, and you can see them in the lumen of the stomach. Very uncommon and very easy to then re reposition the leads. Bowel obstruction has been reported because the leads kind of have to go through the abdominal cavity. They can twist. They can rotate. They can take small bowel with it. There, there's been reports. Again, few and far between, lead entanglement, volvulus, uh, electrical problems. So all of that has to be reported, but in, in the 10 that we've done and in probably the 3,000 that have been done throughout the world, the side effect adverse events are probably in the 1 to 2 percent range. Really not much more than that. My last slide here just takes a look at maybe new horizons. Where is all this going to go? Well, I think personally that we're learning how to map out these people's stomachs with gastroparesis. Not all of it is abnormalities along the greater curvature. We're going to probably find that there are multiple sites in multiple locations of the stomach that we can stimulate with these type of devices. We may find that dual pulsing 
Short pulse, long pulse is the most efficient way to uh, entrain these people's stomach. Maybe it'll be synchronized. Maybe eventually we will try to get uh, tuned up with the normal slow wave pattern of the stomach at, at three per minute. And again, ghrelin. We're going to see a lot about ghrelin here in the next couple of years. You're seeing it in the bariatric world. It's a very exciting hormone to stimulate emptying. Maybe cisapride will come back. I, I doubt it. Domperidone, we'd like to see easier access rather than having to go to Canada with it. A lot of people are trying to get it back in the States. So I hope that gave you a little bit of an overview of, of gastric motility and paresis, kind of where we've been with, with these drugs, which have been not great, and now where we have with this new technology. If you have people that maybe fit this whole thing, let, let me have a chance to see them. I'll be happy to go over them with you, look at their emptying studies, see if they'd be candidates, and very, very happy to work with Steve Hodgett in, in putting these things in. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, how about the use of sympathetic blockage? Sympathetic blockage? Right, because, uh, to enhance emptying? Have you seen that, have you seen that done? Because again, remember the sympathetic. If it would make sense physiologically. It's not being done. It's not right. Right. It can help that type of disorder. I'm not sure what the vagus would do with that information blocked up here if it would enhance emptying. Again, the vagus very selective in, in how it works with the stomach and small bowel compared to other places. It makes good sense, uh, and that's maybe something that we need to look at. Other questions? Yes, sir, in the back? Can hepatitis be a cause of gastroparesis? Can? Can gastritis be a cause? Well, gastritis is caused, for the most part, by H. pylori, isn't it? And a lot of people believe that the atrophy of H. pylori gastritis may have something to do with the hypoganglionosis that we see with this disorder. There's not a strong connection between the two, but people are looking at that. And H. pylori probably has its fingers in a lot of different directions. You're right. Just like the viral idiopathics, we don't really know why. Is it CMV or Epstein-Barr? Are there other viruses that are attacking these ganglia? Don't know why this happens. It, it's a fascination. Yes, Todd? John, in the pyloric spasm component of diabetics, I see people using botulinum toxin Botox. Do you think that's useful or not? Beautiful question. There have been three randomized, double-blind controlled trials to show that Botox does not play a role in enhancing gastric emptying. We've done it over the years because it's easy and it makes some sense. Right, Todd? We inject Botox into the pyloric muscle. We think, oh, okay, we're doing something to help these poor patients. You know, I would say that 10, 20 percent of them say they, they get some benefit. I think a lot of it's placebo effect because, again, there have been no controlled trials to promote it. And again, if you're seeing people do it, it's, it's really not condoned, if you will. So that's where Botox is, unfortunately. Last one. Yes. You're right. Some of the newer diabetic agents are very powerful anti-motility drugs. So you have to be aware, once they're first proved, do they have it before they go on? When they go on those drugs and they have paresis, you better be ready to, to deal with it. Domperidone, stimulation, something is going to have to counteract where those drugs are going. That's very important. Thank you, John. Thanks very much. Thank you.